This is on, right? Okay. Um, but I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak uh, at this meeting, and it's it's been a very uh, enjoyable meeting for me to attend and to learn about some of the things going on in the cactus community, in our uh, in Saint Tulke community, and um, and I hope that we can, you know, anyway, uh, continue to talk together and share ideas and and uh, codes and other things. Um, I'm pleased to talk to you about the Dendro Code today. Uh, this is a project that we're working on at BYU and um, with collaborators in the School of Computer Sci uh, Computing Sciences at the University of Utah. And uh, so we're kind of a small group, but we are open to anyone who would like to help us because we need help. Um, as you know, I mean, developing these things in, in relativity is really a, a big job. It requires a lot of, of manpower, and um, anyway, we've already benefited from several things from uh, working with people in science. Our motivation is to look at problems that are requiring a lot of resolution and computational power. Uh, one of those is binaries of high mass ratios. Uh, these can be intermediate mass binary or intermediate mass black holes um, that form binaries where the mass ratio is saying something up like to 100. Uh, these could form in various ways. There's actually a, a really, some really fascinating questions that relate to these intermediate mass black holes about where they come from and uh, how they may, where they may be, and so on. Um, also, black holes with high spins are uh, require a lot of resolution. It's very close to the horizon. It's small, and uh, these can be important sources for both LIGO and LISA. Um, the thing that they share in common is that they need a lot of resolution, and that we need a lot of high performance to uh, to use these to, to run these simulations efficiently on modern architectures. So we have uh, been working on this new Dendro DR code that has a few features that I'd like to highlight. Um, it uses a very low cost uh, adapt, wavelet adapt with multi-resolution. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. The Dendro code is an unstructured octree code. Uh, it uses a space filling curve for load balancing. Uh, we generate our uh, Essentially, the right hand side code for the right hand side is using a uh, uh, code based on Senpai that can adapt the right hand side for different architectures. And then I'll show you some of our um, initial results. So, I'd first like to talk about the wavelet uh, adaptive multi resolution. Um, you've all seen pictures or movies something like this. This is something we did with the hat code showing two binary black holes. You can't really see it very well, but there are actually boxes around each individual hole that are moving around as well. Um, when you look at this and just think about it, you, you see that we're trying to put something round into a square box. And the geometry of the grids doesn't really adapt to the problem very well. Uh, there are a lot of wasted points, especially out of the corners of these cubes or these uh, uh, boxes of refinements. And uh, this nested type grid structure can lead to a lot of inefficiency for that reason. Um, this is a picture from a simulation we did of a relativistic blast wave using the WAM or, or wavelets adaptive multi-resolution. Um, here the, this is just a, a, a detail where what we have is like an explosion where we have a blast wave with a reverse shock that's traveling outward at like 0.99 something C. Um, the Lorenz factor I think is roughly 10 here. Uh, there's a reverse shock that sets up, and then there's a rated Taylor instability that sets up in between the uh, two shocks. There's really nothing else interesting happening anywhere other than at this shock front. And so if you're computing this on a large grid, you don't want resolution in front of it or high resolution behind the wave. And so you see how the, using this, um, this wave of multi-resolution, we're able to automatically track in on where the interesting features are and just follow that. And uh, I guess I should have said at the beginning here that I'm plotting only points 
on the grid that are used for computational purposes. So where you see white with a few little speckles, that's where we have very little resolution. But you can see we have a lot of resolution right where the interesting things are happening. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how the works. I'm going to make this, I'm not going to go into all the details here mathematically. Mathematically, this is done by formally defining a, an expansion and a wavelet basis that's represented by these different dots on the, on the left that I'm going to just slide over. Um, but I'm going to tell you the simplest, um, switch microphones here. The simple explanation kind of goes like this. Imagine I have uh, uh, these points that are in solid black here defined on the grid. And I know function values there. Um, I can use just simple Lagrangian interpolation to find an estimate for the value of the function at this point. Now, if I come back later and say, well, actually, the function value is not what you estimated, but it's something a little bit different, then this difference here is, is basically is the wavelet coefficient. And if that difference is small, like smaller than my air tolerance, then I might say, hey, let's just drop that point. I don't need it. If I need to know the value of the function there, I would just simply interpolate from the neighbors. If the difference is large, then I say, oops, I better keep that point here, and uh, maybe even want to refine a little bit more. Okay? And so the, the main idea is we basically construct a series of wavelet bases uh, using a, a scale function that's shown here. Um, we construct a unique basis by eliminating points that appear on, on different levels of, of this hierarchical grid. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, I go through and I say, well, I didn't need these points here, and I didn't need these points here, so I can eliminate them. And this gives me a sparse representation for the grid. Uh, it might, see a little, might make a little more sense when we look at an example here of a, of a kind of a standard test problem when you're uh, for a relativistic fluid code, where we have, um, it's called a hard relativistic shock. It's basically a, a shock uh, that has a very high transverse speed across the shock, um, and or across the initial discontinuity. And you evolve this for a little bit, and you see kind of the standard pictures here of the shock tube solution for the pressure, the density, the, uh, the two velocity components. This figure in the lower right here, this is showing you the grid structure, okay? Now, um, it kind of goes backwards maybe from your thinking, but the, course, the points on the coarsest grid are shown on the bottom line. The next uh, grid uh, points are shown here. These have, uh, the combination of these two, you can see these points are staggered so that I have uh, twice, if I use these two grids, I have twice the resolution that I had on the initial grid. And then as I keep going up in the grid hierarchy, you can see the actual points used in the calculation. You can see as we go up to grid level five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever, um, I now am defining grid points only on a small part of the entire computational domain. And you can see where those points are being defined, where they're being defined. They're, well, they're coming in where the shock is. That's because Lagrangian interpolation is never going to a, a converge on a shock, right? It's a discontinuous solution. So I'm going to refine until level 10 where I guess I said stop and don't do any more. Um, you'll also see that it's refining uh, as a lot on the contact discontinuity. So that's this discontinuity and the density right here. And then also you see a lot of refinements right here. And you say, well, what's going on there? Well, these are regions where, this, again, the solution is not differentiable. And so I'm not going to get a smooth uh, interpolation there, OK, even though the function is continuous. Um, so that's an example of refinement on uh, a relatively fluid problem. This shows you the uh, convergence of uh, our solution to that problem. To, I mean, the convergence to the exact solution. The green line here is for the uh, uniform grid. So different number of points used on the uniform grid and the L1 error in the, in the density. And then these other blue, red, black lines are for uh, wavelet grids with different error tolerances of, um, I actually don't remember them off the head, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 tolerances. Okay. Um, this looks a lot like 
uh, the plot that Larry showed you, except Larry had numbers like 32 here, and I have 1,000, but it's like that. That's the idea. A little bit about our code. Dendro is a, an Octree code. It was developed uh, by uh, multiple people, uh, my, including my collaborator, Harry Sundar. Um, Dendro was originally a finite element and DG code. So Ari thinks one day that we'll put DG, we can do DG to solve Einstein equations as well. Um, I say that we'll wait until Larry figures out how to do it exactly and gets all the tricks down. <laughs> then we'll take his place and we'll uh, think about that. Um, uh, the grid basically has, we, you know, we think about a, a grid with where we may need refinement in special places. And you can see how it is subdivided always by a ratio of two, and this uh, creates the arc tree that we uh, use as our fundamental data structure. Nindro, um, uh, we want to be able to uh, generate right-hand sides for the equations that are architecture dependent. So we have a, a Python code that uses SymPy to, where you can kind of type in the equations, hopefully in, in a way that looks something like what you write them down on paper. And then it generates um, different right-hand sides. And, uh, you know, it's easy for me to do the one here for C++ or C, uh, but the value of talking with people in computer science is really demonstrated here because I haven't done any of the work with CUDA. It's a more complicated code generation because you now need to worry about tiling your data for the physical specifications of the, uh, of the GPU you're running on. You have to worry about manually transferring memory from global to shared and back. Um, some guys in Sri Lanka are doing this. You know, it's collaborators of, uh, you know, of, of Hari who are in computer science. And um, for the vectorized SIMD code, it's something that we've uh, played a little bit around with. And Hari said, this is a really hard problem. You know, I know some guys that do compiler development at Carnegie Mellon, maybe they'd be interested to say, here's something that's really hard. Can you take this set of equations figure out the way to evaluate them in an order where you minimize the loading from RAM, because as was mentioned yesterday, this is something that takes a very long time compared to any of the actual um, uh, floating point operations. So anyway, we hope that these, uh, these collaborations really help us to make the code more efficient. The basic uh, computational methods that we use are fairly standard. I'm going to talk mostly about the Einstein equations. We're using the BSSN formulation currently with fourth order spatial differencing and we're using Chrysler dissipation. Um, the load balancing and is done with a space filling curve. So the, this is a Hilbert curve, a level five Hilbert curve. And it gives an easy way to say, simply divide that among three domains in a way that optimizes the per locality so that points that are next to one another physically are on the same uh, processor as much as possible. Uh, when the work I showed you a little bit with fluids, these are again just kind of standard high resolution shock capturing techniques for the fluids. Uh, this is our time stepping algorithm. Um, to make this computationally efficient, we have to kind of, we have kind of two competing demands here. We have a a, a nice octree and wavelet refinement that I, I hope looks you know really cool. You think, hey, that is a nice way to minimize the amount of computational work I need to do to calculate something. Um, and then you face the reality that you know uh, CPUs these days are are SIMD vector operate you know are optimized with SIMD vector operations, and so I want to have nice kind of uniform blocks of code to work with. And so our actual process of doing the run your cut of step uh, goes something like this. We start with the initial grid that is a sparse um, representation of the solution. Each of the blocks then is, is split up into what we call um, our unzip step. Uh, these uniform blocks are then run through uh, we calculate the right hand sides on all of these and up or we calculate the right hand sides 
and um, on these uniform blocks where we've seen these vectorized uh, commands for the right hand side, and then we make them sparse again, throw away the, uh, the unneeded points, and do the update for that stage of Runger Kata, and then this process repeats. The scaling that we've uh, tested so far, these are scaling tests on Titan with 18 levels of refinement in our code out to 101. This is a weak scaling test out to 131,000 cores, and it looks fairly flat. Uh, the dark blue, or the blue color here, is the communication overhead. Green is the evaluation of the right hand side. Um, the zipping, unzipping stage that I just mentioned is the red. The wavelet transform is even smaller than all of these. It doesn't even matter. The wavelet uh, basis is compact, it's local. So all of the decisions about refinement really require no extra overhead. This is a strong scaling test, also done on Titan up to from 4,000 to 65,000 cores. So now I'll just show you some of our binary black hole tests. Uh, this is a simple, quick binary um, black hole run. This shows you, uh, um, this is a, a, from a simulation of a 10 to 1 mass ratio of black hole. Uh, you can see the large black hole here, it's kind of got the yellow outline and it goes down to blue. This is the black hole right here that is 10 times smaller in mass. And I'm going to show you the, what the grid looks like that we're uh, computing on. As I zoom in, you, I'm going to zoom in on the small black hole. And you can see how the grid uh, is, uh, for this evolution, is generated around the small black hole. You can see the refinement is very efficient. It's focused. It's done automatically. We don't you know, do anything special. Um, as we just calculate, we just specify which function to use for the wavelet uh, transform, uh, and then the follows. Um, for that first little movie, I showed you just kind of a quick binary in spiral of two equal mass black holes with. Uh, um, they were initially spaced eight, eight uh, units apart in mass. Uh, this is the trajectories, and what we've just been most working on most recently is getting the wave extraction to work. This is psi four extracted as a function of time uh, to calculate the. This is the C two uh, two component of psi four uh, to calculate these coefficients. We're using. Um, I can't remember the name now. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's uh, a really, it's the equivalent of Gaussian integration or sphere, Lebedev integration, I think it's called. It's very cool algorithm. Um, this this kind of just shows you the the uh, the nice thing about the wavelet based res uh, uh, multi resolution we're using compared to the block AMR that I was showing you earlier. Um, on this plot here, it it's, it's, takes a little bit of time to understand what's being done here, but we have the amount of time to solution here on the vertical axis. Along the horizontal axis, notice that, these, that it's like we're astronomers, we're doing things backwards. We're going from zero here on the right to one here on the left, okay? Um, if we had just a regular grid, uh, then the time to solution would be this dashed line right here, okay? Um, if we add in this extra overhead of doing the zipping and unzipping, that adds uh, roughly 20% more time here and it gets us this black solid line. So if we were doing a, um, uh, a regular grid, say with a, um, this is the amount of time that it would take. The lines that are shown here are for, for different uh, types of resolution. So what's actually plotted on the horizontal axis is the number of octants in the tree versus the number we would need for a regular grid. 
So if we're out here at 10 to the minus 8, then that means I have my tree is very sparse and I only need, you know, um, one for every 10 to the 8 that are on the regular grid, okay? For the refinement that we're getting, that's where we are for equal mass and for a 10 to 1 mass ratio uh, binary, okay? For the block type AMR that I showed you in the very first movie that we had, the had code, you're operating over here in this region here. And so this is a measure of the efficiency of the, of the refinement algorithm. The number of points needed on our grid to represent the solution compared to the maximum for a uniform space grid. Okay, um, we're working on several current projects. I just want to give you a little overhead. One thing we're working on this summer right is at the University of Utah is to add in local time stepping. Uh, currently our code uses a global fixed time step. All points are updated simultaneously. Um, we're now adding in the ability to have this local time stepping and, and figuring out, again, anyway, dependencies between points to the shown in this figure. Um, we're coming on with uh, work with our GPUs. Um, the, I'll just give you a quick rundown of our strategy for working with GPUs. Uh, imagine we have this block of data here that's kind of the shaded green. Um, the data that's shaded green here depends on data from other processors uh, that here is shaded red, okay? And um, of course communication between processors is usually done between uh, CPU cores. And so way, the way we have uh, set up our code to work with both CPUs and GPUs is to have the CPU handle communication. So this series of, this kind of shows you a time scale along the horizontal axis here. Initially, when the time step begins, we will do our communication from one uh, uh, node to another here. And that's communicating data that comes in these red boundaries. Um, then we will also, the, uh, the region shaded green here has two colors. The light green color will be uh, zones that are updated by the CPU. These depend on communication from, from other, other neighbors. But the interior part of the grid doesn't really require communication from anyone else. So we can go ahead and get started on uh, computing this part of the grid, the right-hand sides, with the GPUs. And so initially we initiate the communication between CPUs, but also we initiate communication between the uh, CPU, the local CPU, and the GPU. Um, as soon as the GPU gets uh, information coming in, it can start computing the right-hand side. Um, and then the GPU sends those right-hand sides back out. You can see this is all done with asynchronous communication. And um, these zones here at the very, uh, here, they may depend on information that, of course, that has come in from uh, the red zones and also information from zones for the, the GPU has, and then right-hand sides are computed there with the CPU. So that's the way this uh, calculation is interleaved between both the CPU and the GPU. And uh, this shows you a plot of the stability. Um, using this hybrid code, it runs on both the GPUs and CPUs. Uh, again, in the different phases of the code, but the calculation are uh, highlighted by color, but this is a weak scaling plot up to uh, 8,000 nodes and um, a strong scaling plot to 4,000 nodes using the hybrid GPU CPU. Um, our code is open source. The, uh, we have a public version um, that is available here on GitHub. Uh, this public version, I need someone to like play around with it, email me and tell me what's broken. Uh, I think there might be some, anyway, some things that aren't quite clear. Um, but you're welcome to play around with it. The public version has an example that I'll show you in a moment. It doesn't have the VSSN part yet because we're still trying to get that finished. But when we get the VSSN part, it will be uh, made publicly available as well. It's very easy to compile, at least compared to projects I used to work on. 
Um, it's all written in, the code is all written in C++, it compiles a CMake, does require the GNU Scientific Library and MPI, and uh, code is optional. Uh, in the public version we have, um, right now, the nonlinear scalar wave equation and the code for the Maxwell equations uh, written in any kind of a BSSN style. And um, this is the uh, little nonlinear scalar wave that's going to play with in the public version here. Uh, anyway, it's a scalar wave with a, a source term for the origin. Okay, well, thank you. said this and I probably just missed it, but when you take your time steps, do you take uh, bigger time steps on the coarser parts of the grid or is it uniform? Uh, currently it's uniform, but we're adding, that's what we're doing this summer is making it so that we can have local time stepping depending on the, on this, on the resolution. Cool. scaling tests, and I don't know what they were doing uh, in that test. Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, as I said, we started talking about doing the GPUs, and, and I was like, well, I've got this collaborator, Sri Lanka, and that's a specialty. And that was kind of all pushed off to them, and I haven't, uh, I'm not as aware of all the issues that they're, they're working with that. That's a good question. How difficult it is to be able to add a hydro to this um, code and then follow also the hydrodynamics equations and all the fluid together with the codes. Yes, so could you say that again? I okay, I was wondering how difficult it is to solve also the equation for uh, hydrodynamics or manipulodynamics within this code. So it's not difficult. Um, it, I, I keep saying it's going to be done and it's not yet done, but uh, if you're a developer, Kind of what you think about is is this picture here. Let's see, where's my mouse? So this picture here, um, if you're a developer, what I think about is this is all I need to write code for a uniform block of, of data that's coming in. And so you can pretty much take your fluid code right now probably and, and say, I'm just gonna take the right-hand side segment and plug it in right here where Dendro calls the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. And then of course you're gonna have to add in some other things like the primitive solver and, and there might be other things that go along with it. But as far as writing the fluid code goes, I think it's gonna be fairly straightforward. Uh, I had a student who I had hoped would uh, do that this summer, but he got an internship at Los Alamos and isn't, uh, <laughs> isn't doing it. So, anyway. but uh, I think it will be fairly straightforward. The the other fluid evolution I showed a couple of fluid solutions before. Those were done with a kind of our test version of a code that we wrote. They're, they weren't done with with Dendro. but they're using the same wavelets and the same and and you know. Kind of just the standard for the updates. Hey, Scott. That's great. Um, so, uh, unstructured DMR is great for optimizing test users. Not so great for optimizing time solutions. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like, if it, for instance, it does give you less time to fit in the more cycles. Uh 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I think there, there are two, two ways maybe to think about that. So we have tried to increase, at least for the calculation right hand side, increase the speed by, by trying to exploit the SIMD vector commands that we can. Um, on the other side, um, we're going for high scalability. And you know, if we can run on 100,000 cores uh, and the machines are only going to get bigger, that will help us also lower the time to solution as well. But you, you can only scale if your problem also scale with the core. Right? Yeah. Because you'll run out of life. Um, your, your algorithm is too efficient. Right? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, there's there's always uh, scaling issues, but um, uh, maybe I don't quite understand your question, but uh, anyway, but I maybe should talk to you after to make sure I quite I fully understand what you're talking about. So we will have some working group, and not with me, um, but we will have uh, we can use the one in discussion session, session uh, round table of discussions tomorrow, where we can talk about uh, the details and do you use the same function for all the different functions, for example, when solving this equation, or do you use one big function and the last function or something else to determine to decide which weight that points to be for all the different functions? Right now we're using the same wavelets coefficient, the same wavelet basis for all of them. So which function do you use then to decide? Oh, which functions do we use? So we have it set up in the code so that we can do um, a variety when we're when we're using the fluid codes, we use the primitive variables for calculation of the wavelet coefficients. Uh, with the BSSN code, we've tried various things. Um, right now, we're primarily using the uh, conformal factor chi and the lapse function alpha. Um, we've also used done some tests with the metric that seems to to work fairly well. Uh, if we add in the extrinsic curvature or the in the BSSN formulation, the capital gammas, it tends to over refine by I because they're, for whatever reason, seem to be a little noisier in the BSSN formulation. Um, but usually we're using the, the, the lapse, chi, and the metric to uh, calculate the wavelet coefficients. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker is, is um, Wolfgang Tichy, who's going to be presenting remotely. And basically, what I'm going to need Wolfgang to do is just start sharing his screen. And as soon as that's set up, we will move over here and uh, to avoid any feedback. And um, Wolfgang, you can start broadcasting video uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, he's broadcasting. Oh. Okay. Um, but uh, he, uh, voice on. Let let he turn the voice on. His voice is off. Oh. Um, uh, his, his. his is off. The button. Um, there. Just re remind him to. Now, you can speak to him. Okay. So so okay. Um, just uh. uh Unmute your microphone and you can begin as soon as you're ready.
should hear something from here. The problem is the computer doesn't have a sound. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we must use that one. Um, 